Here we are, Martina. Hi. Hi, good afternoon. Ciao, Alessandra. Ciao. So where are you today? I am in Milan and you in Rome. Yes, I am. And I put together some of the objects, some of the antique jewelry we are both passionate about. Yes, and I so, think we're, yeah. Well, in your honor, I, I'm wearing my micro mosaic earrings that I love so much which I don't wear every single day, but I thought on this occasion it might be a good, a, a good idea. Well, to tell you the truth, I wear them every single day because I, can, I cannot live without them. So as you know, I'm very passionate about this field. And so I just wanted to, to start with uh, really telling, it, telling our friends how we met. Actually, it's, uh, it was a long time ago and actually it was really my father and your father, Leonardo Mondadori, who was a passionate collector also of yes. interesting, beautiful and rare objects. Yes. So tell us about him, because I have great memories. And, but of course, you it's can say maybe something. It's, it's, first of all, thank you. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a real pleasure for me every time to talk about him. Um, so it's, uh, well, thank you for asking me. But, yeah, well, my father has been, first of all, he's been an incredible father to me, uh, very inspirational, um, very funny too. He had a great character. And more, you know, very importantly, he was so passionate about collecting. His way of collecting was very different to what one has been used to seeing nowadays. You know, he would go into contemporary art, he would go into a you know, very, very old antiques back to, you know, stuff, sort of Roman antiquities and in the middle medieval art, as you know, drawings, uh, works on paper and furniture and small objects, um, anything that would trigger his passion, his eye. So it was very much about collecting as a passion, you know, collecting the love of, and every time he would fall in love with an object, he would do a lot, great deal of studying about you know that that painting that piece of furniture that object um and so you know that's how he would spend his free time you know his sundays in his in his studio in milan or or in the south of italy the other place he had a huge passion for and just spend hours on books and doing research i think for him it was like a quest you know it was like a almost like a treasure hunt and I remember very well, um, well there, he obviously had a great relationship with your father, but I remember once going with my dad into your gallery in, in Piazza di Spagna when your father was still there. And, um, you know, in the same way, we, I went with him in, in Paris and we went to visit also uh, Primo de la Russie, which we've done the exhibition with. And Galerie Kugel, and Galerie Kugel, that was another... And that I was, was a place. You know, I was yeah. I was a teenager, so very often it was boring for me. But at the end of the day, that was the time I would spend with him because you know he was my parents had divorced when I was very little. So um, it, it's been a very enriching experience, and he left so much of his you know curiosity uh, in me. Um, um, and, and he had a taste of. For the one thing I wanted to add to all this kaleidoscopic, you know, e interest he had, he was passionate with uh, uh, Wunderkammer objects. He was passionate with different things, with curiosities. He was, and of course, among these pieces, there were marbles and hard stones. Yes, yes, definitely. And... Um, he, well, there's one incredible iconic piece that he got from your father that is, you know, was the, the kind of centerpiece for his living room in Milan and then became uh, my centerpiece in my houses. So it was first in London, now it's in Milan. So it follows, um, it follows me around and, it's, um, and, and, and it is actually black marble, as you say. Um, but uh, yes, and I and and it's I remember actually, Alessandra, you and I meeting for a coffee in London quite a few years ago, and we yes. had this conversation, which was supposed to be a, a first, you know, an interview for Cabana. And then I remember we just couldn't stop talking, the two of us. We had so much in common, and for yes. me, you know, talking to a woman who was obviously Italian and had such a knowledge about. 
um, uh, you know, antiquities. And, and, and I think, don't you think there is so much about growing up in Italy and just breathing in all this, um, you know, this, I this think culture, this beauty, the beauty of one, everything. One, one of the things I've always thought is that, is that the objects that then we will show together that I also I, I, I displayed here just to give an idea is that this Italian decorative arts they, they reflect the colors, the atmosphere, the life that, that we are all used uh, yes. to, to have around us, that we are surrounded by, just, you know, going out for a walk. And there is really, the ref they reflect, this is what they reflect, the colors, the quality of the light, um, all these transparencies, all these reflections, amazing materials full of... of uh, yeah. happiness and and life and that's and, it's, uh, it, and it that is that true is... that it is a very warm uh a, a very warm palette a very warm colors that we're always surrounded by the buildings even in you know city like bologna for instance think about that that tobacco color of most buildings yes. or in the light in rome or you know anyone or, lucky or naples enough. And Naples, Naples yes. a wonderful capital of Europe, uh, in, in front of the sea with this, you know, with the smell of the sea that is, uh, that is part of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the And I think the there's sea. also one more thing which is interesting about, you know, when you are, when, you know, being in Italy, uh, which I realized when I was in London and I actually went to Naples for a friend's wedding and I was there and I had been living in London for a year and all of a sudden it struck me that we have, you know, we put up with chaos, with aesthetic chaos and that is what makes the Italian aesthetic so special. The way that in every, you know, in the cities you would see, you know, Baroque mixed with, uh, you know, uh, old Roman things and then, you know, neoclassical and it all comes together. And the Layers. Happens. Layers, one on the top layers. of the other, yes. Yeah. And, and now we move into the one of the subjects of our conversation, right? Yes. Mongiardino and, and then Forquet. Federico Forquet. Yeah. And, and then remember when you cura curated the exhibition, when Cabana curated the exhibition for Galerie Cugel, Brimo de la Russie, uh, and, and, and myself Cabana. in New York, you were also presenting this, this incredible book full of uh, magnificent photos by Guido Taroni. Yes. And, and that's also, you know, that at that time we met and you presented the book and maybe I can show the book or maybe you have it with I you. I have it here. I, oh, yes. I'd be very happy to show it. Yes. And it's the book we published in 2017. Our exhibition was, oh, you're giving a, us an insight already into your space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I told you that I, I put together some objects, a display of objects, but this is something we will see later on. I, j I just wanted to show you some of the pages of the book you, re you presented. So here we are, Renzo Mongiardino, a painterly vision. That's a painterly vision, yes. So that, ooh. That's, that's a room I love talking about. <laughs> can I say something now and then we can talk more into that? Please, about please, Mongiardino because I remember in New York you spent some words on this, on this room and it, I was very impressed. So, please. Yes, because also it takes us, I think, to, to discussing also how one can decorate a room with antiques and with, with objects. So that room, which is the dining room, in my mother's apartment where I grew up here in Milan, and it's still exactly the same, um, so that room was decorated, the house, the apartment was decorated by Mongiardino for my mother, who was one of his closest friends in 1977. And that dining room um, actually was the, you know, the kind of uh, nudge that he gave to my mother because my mother uh, had asked him, you know, had, had told him, I love red, blue and green. And the result was, you know, the living room, which is this one on the cover, which was instead yes. black. So my mother had a bit of a shock when she was, you know, given the plans for a black room. And so he told her, you know, he said to her, please trust me, give me, you know, carte blanche for the living room. I will give you your colors in the dining room. 
So this room was originally planned just with that, you know, it's a very simple red Laura Ashley fabric with some stencils that his artisans then kind of uh, produced uh, and painted on top that are green and blue. Um, and there were no plates originally. And then what happened was one day he was having lunch there and my mother uh, served dessert in Imari plates, exactly those. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he finished his dessert and got his plate and started wandering around the room and said, Paula, who's my mother, Paula, how many of these do you have? And she said, well, I think six or eight. Oh, I'm sure you can find more at <laughs> antique fairs and markets around, you know, let's start hanging them on the walls. And originally there were only eight. And then over 10 or 15 years, she filled up the room with these beautiful antique plates. But it's, it's, it's just a very interesting way of uh, layering a room uh, after, after it was done. Um, and, 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 you with, said, and you said that not all of them were extremely expensive. I mean, it was also, they, she would find them all, everywhere. Yes, yes, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Well, this is one of my also, I think this is a house in Rome. Um, uh, just, I just put a mark on another house that I love because... I think yes. that one of the skills of Renzo Mongiardino was to find beautiful objects, exactly like your father and my father. He understood the quality of the objects. So he would start from a chimney piece like this one, for, for example, or yeah. you know, from a pair of columns in marble with beautiful vases or from an antique sculpture and build a decoration around it with his amazing craftsmen, right? Yeah, he would give a lot of well, let's not forget, as we were talking earlier before this live, he was a pupil of Gioponti uh, in Milan at the university here in Milan. Gioponti was his teacher. So, um, you know, I think for him, architecture, he was quintessentially an architect and architecture and symmetry. And, you it's know, unbelievable. I mean, Gioponti and Renzo Mongiardino, incredible. <laughs> wow, it's weird. I know, but it was always extremely important. And, you know, the, the, the sort of rules of uh, Renaissance, you know, first the uh, antique uh, world and then the Renaissance, again, played a huge influence on him um, uh, and his passion for the studioli. And, uh, but uh, definitely then, you know, so for him, it was the proportions of the room that dictated the decoration the symmetry that he would impose even if it wasn't there. So he would open windows or create doors where there weren't. The symmetry was everything to him. And then, as you say, he would start with one object, one very important uh, object, whether a mantelpiece, whether a column, whether a clock. And that antique object, whether it was you know, uh, already within the collection of his client, because let's not forget he had some of the most incredible collectors as clients. I mean, I remember I once asked him, which is your, you know, the project you, you love the most doing? And he said, L'Hotel Lambert in Paris for Guy de Rothschild um, at, uh, 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 on Lille Saint-Louis, because, you know, he said it was just, you know, deciding between incredible old masters and you would literally have to decide what would go on the wall and what would go, have to go back in storage. Exactly. Um, so it's, it's, it's the importance of the collection or he would, you know, he had a great relationship with antique dealers uh, like your father or the Kugels and he would pick an object, make, make it into and then decorate the room around that object and very often have his artisans get a detail from that object, maybe a detail from a clock, a decorative detail and develop then wall patterns that would reflect that detail. Yes. But tell us something about this, this chimney, this, this fireplace is incredible. Well, this is something that probably would have attracted uh, his uh, interest because this is a chimney, a monumental chimney piece, actually. It originally came from the collection of uh, Mona Williams, of Bona Bismarck, and, and that's where my father bought it. And uh, it's by uh, two major artists uh, acti active in Rome at the end of the 18th century. Uh, Lorenzo Cardelli, who was responsible for the carving, and the quality of the carving is mm -hmm. quite extraordinary. 
and uh, and and this is aguati this is uh, one of the most accomplished one of the geniuses of the micro mosaics uh, who is, who who developed a technique around 1775 the technique of the smaltifilati and and you see all the different shades of the, the quality of these mosaics is uh, is uh, is outstanding and so and now since we are now in the field of mosaics uh, i think we can move to another decorator that we both love yes Federico Forche and we yes. both admire so yes and, and he's he's a very dear uh, close friend of yours and i adore him i think it's, he's one of the most interesting and funny and he has all the qualities um i think you know a man and a decorator should have very entertaining as well um and the book that so we the, the book you wrote also a chapter in this book and it showcases your house okay, this, we this have, is the book we Federico share Forche. photographer yeah. guido taroni i have it here too okay great and um, and yes same photographer and and actually the passion of Federico Forche for objects is also quite outstanding. This is, this is a picture I, lo I love of part of the collection of uh, Federico Forche micro mosaics. And this, is, and this is why I moved from the mantelpiece to this, uh, to this picture, which you know, puts together this uh, this incredible collection that he that he put together through the years because he is a real collector himself right i mean that's also a difference with mongiardino mongiardino would would have a great eye for his clients but federico has a passion himself and a knowledge on right neoclass the sort of neoclassical period and in particular on his two cities naples and rome well federico for che who is today nine years old, uh, he's still very, very pa a passionate buyer and collector. Uh, actually, he, um, he, he decided to give his collection to the Italian National Trust, to the FAI, which is something also extraordinary. The other aspect of Federico that I always admired is that he was always very generous in lending his works of art for public exhibitions, and so he's, he's always been, you know, passionate, not only for himself, but also very, very generous to, to show Stepping. his art. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's something that, I, that I, something that I really appreciate in, uh, in collectors. Not, you know, not the collector who just keeps the object in the secret of his room, but someone who loves to share his passion. And, and, and actually, he was also, he's also very contagious. And, and when he helped me decorating my apartment, he was, uh, it, it was an experience because he, he first of all, he ha he, he's very knowledgeable. And, and, and of course, he's, uh, he really, when, when he wants an object, he wants it. And if he sees something that he, even, you know, I'm an antique dealer, but when he decides that something fits that that specific angle or, or wall of the room there's nothing you can do that's it has to it has to stay there and uh, and and again he he was born in naples as you know he started i think he bought his first object when he was 14 years old or 15 years old uh, it was something that he saw a small egyptian figure that he saw in an in the window of an antique dealer in uh, near Piazza dei Martiri. And as an adolescent, as a, a young child, he went to his father with his uh, little object and he, he, you know, aged, I don't know, 12, 13, he, he showed his father this object and that's when his collection started. And again, I'm always interested when, when we see these collectors, when we meet these collectors, to ask, what is the first object you bought? So Martina, what is the first object you bought? Me. Yes. Well, I think I think it's it's. Uh, I remember it's uh, antique text object. Oh, sorry, I was talking about textiles. Um, objects. I think it's actually ceramics. I have a huge passion for um, for ceramics. 
Um, and, and, and then these were amongst the first things, if you consider these objects, um, that uh, sort of, you know, triggered, triggered my, uh, my passion and my, and my imagination. And I, I personally have a passion for, you know, for uh, antique Italian things and for uh, Middle Eastern antiquities as well. Um, and, and it's, it, and, and actually it's interesting how, you know, in, in a place like Naples and in the South of Italy, you see these two worlds coming together, um, the Middle East and the South, uh, and, and, it, and Italy and uh, the Italian antiquities. It's the Mediterranean. Um, it's this uh, koine of language that, you know, puts together all the different areas of, uh, I think one of the interesting things also in, in Federico's book um, is also the sort of Neapolitan room that is towards yeah. the end of the book. Um, yes. Is, yeah. So full of incredible objects and this Pompeian red that he uses in this room so much. I think the period that fascinated and attracted Federico the most was uh, the you know, the Naples of uh, uh, Hamilton, of, uh, of, I'm always thinking of Lady Hamilton, of uh, her taste uh, for the antiques, of the excavations of Pompeii and Ercolano. And the Neapolitan room is actually an incredible, um, uh, how can I call it? It's, it's, it's um, you have all these different materials samplers of all different materials. He goes from not, not only the mosaics that we mentioned before, but for instance, uh, biscuit porcelains or, or um, in f pieces of furniture with uh, inspired after Greek vases after the antiques uh, that I've seen only three times uh, in my life. And then yeah. porphyry and uh, um, that's an, another incredible thing I, I love every time I see a porphyry object. Um, it's, it, it is uh, incredible, yeah. Uh, and well, I have been lucky enough to see some in my life and some uh, great um, sort of in England, in, in some great also dealers' houses in, um, in Italy as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and you know, I think also what makes Federico's houses so interesting is even with these incredibly important objects, uh, he manages to keep a room feel very cozy. Yes, yes. that's I think his talent. This is Porphyry. Yes, and this is uh, the emperor of, of all the of, of the marbles because, as you know, it it was. Uh, it was a privilege of the emperors. Uh, they, 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 they owned the, 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 the caves and the, 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 the quarries, uh, the, yeah. the, 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 the quarries, of, and, they, and, they, and they, they could use them only for, for themselves. And here I have a campionario of marbles. Of marbles, That, yes. that I prepared for you. Yes, that's, that's heaven think... for any decorator. If there are any decorators watching us, this is heaven. You should... <laughs> travel to Rome and, and go see it. Yeah, this is when, you know, when I want to play and, and, and then... And to what, a, what is that? Is that lapis lazuli or...? Yeah, we have some lapis lazuli, yes. exactly. This one, this is malachite, which is not my favorite yes. stone, actually. This is Me the either. red imperial. Me either. Yeah. yeah, it's a little too, too exaggerated. Right. In that's there. probably because we're Italian. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in, a sm in small proportions, it's okay, but then too much, I think it's, uh, yeah. it's not my favorite. And then we have all the Serpentini, the Giallo Antico. This is the Porphyry you were mentioning before. Yeah. And then you have Broccatello di Spagna. Yeah. Here we are. And again, the field, the field of ancient marbles is very closely connected to the to the mosaics. This is, ah, this is interesting. This is a book I found uh, on all the, all the mosaics that this uh, extraordinary artist uh, active in Rome at the end of the 18th century. His name is uh, Michelangelo Barberi. He was really a genius, uh, an entrepreneur. After Giacomo Raffaelli, 
he was the real entrepreneur of uh, micro mosaics and he established um, a workshop in Russia that became very, very famous. And again, the field of, uh, of imperial marbles, of imperial stones, and that one of mosaics is very strictly connected. I'm thinking of someone like Giacomo Raffelli. This is Giacomo Raffelli. Yeah. These are micro, micro mosaics. And he was, uh, he had the kilns, he had the materials. He was able to, to, to make this very, you see, this very regular tessere, and he mm -hmm. sold them to the studio de, del Mosaico Vaticano. And so he was not working only for the studio Vaticano del Mosaico, but he was an, an entrepreneur. He was uh, a businessman. Yeah. And he yeah. went to Milano, actually. So this is and something when, that... When, when did they start applying that to jewelry? Well, they were. This is Aguatti that I mentioned before, and... Uh, Giacomo Raffelli, they invented this new technique. Actually, I have something very, very interesting to show you, you know, for my didactic. You're, make, you're making me very jealous now. now. This is something very, very interesting. This is what they, this is a smalto. This is one of the, this is glass. Yeah. This is, Gosh. you see, this is what they had. And this is what very, was very precious because they produced them. And, yeah. and then, you see, Giacomo Raffelli, this is, this is a rod, this is in glass, mm -hmm. and you see, this is, this, this, is, this is an old one, this is an 18th century one. So they, will make, they would make these very thin rods in glass with, with, uh, with pigments. The pigments were, were, again, they were taken from um, minerals. And, and they, they would fire them at a very high degree of, uh, of heat and make these small rods. And then they would cut them in small, you see, in very small sections. And then they were able to make these incredible objects that became portable works of art yes. for this, in, for this uh, very wealthy and very large uh, community of collectors who came to visit Rome, Milan, Venice at the end of the 18th century and at the beginning of the 19th century, the famous uh, phenomenon of the Grand Tour. Yes, and this course. is what they would buy, you yeah. know, small objects of exquisite quality. And... and they're very hard to find today for you. I mean, you put together an incredible uh, collection of them and uh, yeah, I mean, plaques, box, uh, bracelets. This yes. is something I love. Look at, the, look at the minute scale of this tessere. This is, the black is, is made out of glass. And, yeah, yeah. and these are, I don't know if you can see the minute well, it's, scale it's of It's very this. hard to detect <laughs> you know, it's can... actually micro mosaic, but it is, it, yeah. This is micro micro. This is really... It's, it's really the... And, and how long I, would it take to create objects like those? I mean, well, this is interesting because today we have the, 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 the art historians found a lot of documentation about the process of, uh, of the making of, this, of these objects. And they were very, very expensive. Uh, these artisans were constantly in financial need because they had to buy the materials these materials yeah and and it took months to to to, to make us you know a small this is by domenico moglia you know this was one of the subjects that these travelers uh, love the most animals but then you know you have uh, uh, small very often temples. Like antique rome no yes or uh, scenes of yeah yes like and, and you see the animals. waterfalls or yeah. unbelievable yes. i find for me this is high jewelry there's nothing like um the things you 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 and i remember seeing them for the first time in your um uh back uh, uh when you had them when i came to visit you in, in rome the, the... And, and then we <laughs> yeah uh, again in new york and I have to say, I'm so grateful to you and to the Kugels and, and Primo because curating that exhibition in New York gave me, first of all, it was just like being in a candy store and being able to pick amongst the three best 
some of the best antique dealers in the world and, and all these incredible <laughs> objects to put in an exhibition. But, you know, most importantly, I think it's, it's a matter for my generation. I am turning 40 this year. For my generation to feel at ease with antiques. I think, you know, even if you are a contemporary art collector, um, I mean, just mix it up and go for, you know, uh, it's, there's nothing as charming as, and all of an antique objects are all one of a kind. So that's all yes. that's what makes it them so special. Look at that. That's this, is, this is Castellani. This is Fortunato Pio Castellani. This is a bull. And Castellani worship was also, as, as you know, a, a, one of the most extraordinary uh, adventures of the of the 19th century. This uh, this dynasty, this fam family of uh, of uh, jewelry makers, was very very successful. They were international. They 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 you know they exported everywhere. They opened. They started in Via del Corso actually, and then they moved to London to Paris, and they were. Re, 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 revisiting, reviving the ancient techniques of jewelry, and and this is part. This, these are some objects from their production. You know, this is the, a portrait of uh, Hadrian in Chalcedony, and this is the. I don't know if you can see it, that, yes. but this is the double C in, interlaced double C that you know yeah. you have to see and be, behind the objects. Uh, by the by Fortunato Pio Castellani and by the workshop of Castellani, and this is another beautiful one, one that I like because I like the subject of the of the Medusa. This yes. is another great this, yeah yeah, and again here you have it. I mean, yeah. But the quality of the gold is stunning because it's a very pure gold. They were trying to reproduce the the the, the Etruscan and the Roman techniques. And they were very, you know, they were great at that. They were, and 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 they and and among their clients, there were kings and queens and the aristocrats of the time because they they were able to, you know, really to to reach out an incredible um, uh, yes. group of of of, uh, of collectors. Uh, they, they were very exclusive, yeah. but but we have we have amazing. Uh, Jewelers also today. I'm thinking of Jar. Uh, of course, of Paris. Course. This is uh, a, 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 um, let me show you. This is another object that I love. This is a garnet, a Roman yeah. garnet mounted by Jar. In uh, in a very contemporary way. So again, all the this, detail, yeah. But like um, like Raffaelli, like. Like all the artists that I mentioned before, this is this is Melillo. This is another one I love who was active in Naples around 1840, 1850. But these are these artists were 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 able are able to bring us to the contemporary time. It's it's contemporary. It's, this is art of today, yeah. and and again the the, the technique is it is outstanding. But the idea is, the, the combination of the colors we, is always surprising. This is something that, 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 let me show you. This is something made by Jar. This is an intaglio by Pickler. I don't know if you can see it yes. with the Hercules. Yes. And, but the combination of red color and, and diamonds is something that you you would you would never have in the 18th century. It's something completely new. It's something yeah. unique, and yeah. and this is Definitely. something that is well. This this is just taking. I mean, talk about armchair traveling, taking us to, you know. I think we all need now to see. We're all ready to go back to fairs and to seeing beautiful things. Um, all these all these months in in. in lockdown i think don't you think the moment will hopefully we all be back to a vaguely normal life i think we will all be so thirsty for all this uh for all this beauty um and actually one of the things i love the most doing i think to look at um any antique civilizations um you know jewelry is always so interesting and that's one of the my favorite things to do in london was actually go to the british museum and look at all the different um, civilizations from the past and look at the uh, the way they would they would craft um, you know they would craft uh, their objects of course but also 
uh, the jury and even at the you know at the metropolitan all those sort of from the era of the uh, uh, from the Byzantine um, the jury that that was there is is just uh, unbelievable and such an inspiration for for today because it's everything is so contemporary yeah I just uh, I had the opportunity to to see also what uh, they are doing now in the Middle East uh, in Doha or in Abu Dhabi. Extraordinary yeah. display of this interesting, um, unconventional, and previously seen objects with an, a very interesting kind of display of just a, a disposition of different objects from different uh, provenance and civilizations. And there's always you know, it's, it's something in progress. Also the way that the museums today are thinking about displaying, uh, putting together, showing is, uh, is, is, even for us, I mean, for, for us as antique dealers is, is, uh, is, is, is challenging, is, is interesting. Yes, because um, I would imagine, Alessandra, I mean, I'm, fasc I'm so fascinated by you know your job and your and 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 your colleagues the way you do it because you're always surrounded and looking at great objects um but how how has it evolved over time i mean uh the perception of uh but first of all it, it, you know until the pandemic hit it had evolved also with being a more global uh outreach thanks to fairs like tefaf well you know tefaf uh is working a lot on digital platforms and uh, so in the next days i encourage all our friends that are watching us also to see what's uh, what's going to be broadcasted because of course there's a lot going on um i think uh, that uh, this this period of time has also encouraged us to you know, the, to, to, to rethink about the importance of the, pre, of the actual object, the presence of the object, because although we can, you know, right now we are working in a, on a digital platform, but then what we really want is, uh, you know, to, to touch these objects, to, to live with them, to... to yes, to, now, to, we would to, all want to be there with you, Alessandra, right now and touch them. <laughs> Well, no, uh, we, we, yes. this, this is uh, this is just a uh, you know an am amuse bush of what uh, will be shown at the tap of in presence uh, in the fall, hopefully. So hopefully, so yes, this is, exactly. Hopefully, so I think all my possible. all my dealers' friends are putting together you know new objects and previously seen interesting. And uh, they are they are all working on the information, how to communicate these these objects in a in a different way. I mean, this this period of time has really been interesting for us. We stopped and we could rethink about how to communicate, how to uh, inform, and that's I mean that you are a master in that in that respect because Cabana also changed the way of. Uh, seeing art, of showing art, of also presenting art in a different kind of well, pictures. Of for, for me, it's, for me it's, it's really, I always say, you know, it's, it's, I also know that I am talking to my, to my generation and as an Italian, as an European, uh, I cannot believe that, you know, um, people are not drawn to incredibly beautiful, you know, rooms or incredibly beautiful decorative objects, uh, antiques, uh, and antique objects. I think there's, um, I remember a few years ago um, in London um, visiting an exhibition of the late Oliver Hoare, who was a great dealer in Islamic art. And yes, he, um, his exhibition was more, he said it was more about the book. Uh, which was, and the title of the exhibition and the catalog, which I have here, is called Every Object Tells a Story. And it's so true about antique, uh, antique objects that, you know, when you start thinking all the, you know, whether it's a fireplace, all the houses and the palazzi it's been, you know, in and the, you know, and, and imagine, you know, what, what, 
what has been going on in those rooms or you know when it when it's like a, a, a an object to put you know a, a sculpture or uh, a beautiful piece of furniture um, again you know imagine all the different hands and the stories and the different parts of the world I think it's it's such a trigger for the imagination so that's what I like to do with Cabana how, is how true tell these this stories. is true and you know when we we come from a kind of education that teaches how to read a work of art formally, you know, to describe it in its form. And then the more you grow up, the more you understand that behind each object there's a story, there are, or there are many stories. And I must tell you, my, ex my experience at the Jewish Museum of Rome was key for really, for, for, for me, for my education, because of course, those objects are especially interesting because of this reason. They all have, they all bring a story. And these stories can be amazing. And that's where I learned to focus on the story of, of the objects, what they bring with them, yeah. who commissioned them, when, for whom, what's, and, and these stories are always 99% of the time yeah. fascinating it's like, it's and like incredible. Watching a movie, you know, it's like reading a great novel or, or and just close your eyes and your imagination runs wild. And I think that's what, you know, what makes it, it makes collecting um, great. And even just, you know, looking at incredible objects. I mean, the first time I was in Paris and visited the Kugels Gallery, I mean, that's just like, I don't know. It's 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 a dream in um, in 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 everything and the, the the objects. And then when you go back after some time, and they have a new piece of furniture that you know was in that house, and then you know in in the other, and and just the stories around every um, every but, object. But, I think. But but you know what I what I love about Tefaf is this opportunity for visitors uh, to have this chance to talk to the to the galleries to the dealers and and of course all these you know all, all, all these dealers brands who go from the antiquities to the hyper contemporary to design they are very happy to tell you the story behind yeah, the sorry, object there it, it's a and, and without, you know, being intimidated by, you know, entering the, 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 the locked door but of a shop. Of a no one should be intimidated by antiques or, you know, by, and I think. Exactly. As, as I, you know, I, I really, as you said at the beginning, had a great, um, you know, example in, in my father who really collected for passion and would fall in love with an object and go deep down studying about it. Um, and it is, uh, you know, and it is, it is, it is incredible. And what you were saying before about Federico, who started when he was a teenager, I mean, that's just when you have the, f your f you know, the fire of the passion for collecting. Um, someone else who is like that is also Umberto Pasti, who started so early, who's such a good friend of Federico. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great community. I, I can't wait to be all in the same room again together and, <laughs> um, have, but um, maybe people have questions for us. Um, what do you think? No, I, not have, yet. I have many comments. Yeah, uh, no, we don't I'll, have any. If, if huge number of comments. If you have questions, please. But let me see. Actually, there are uh, actually they are liking the stories and. Uh, this they are talking about education culture i don't i don't i mean there are so many okay, no <laughs> questions at the moment <laughs> yeah let me see give me one second allora um this is something they're asking uh, uh please tell us about your passion of being an ambassador of culture of history and uh yeah. thank you this is for you is it for yeah. me or for you maybe no, I i'm sure know. it's for you the ambassador of culture no. you you are you you I'm have not, with I'm not an ambassador you... of anything but uh of culture i think it's more Alessandro than me but i think uh, no but as i said before it's what i loved sort of 
I love to champion with, with Cabana is really to, uh, you know, have to, to sort of communicate the message that it's, um, it's great to be surrounded by, you know, to look at great interiors, uh, even when they're very, very simple. Um, and also to go back to, uh, you know, to looking at decorative objects. Um, and I really always say that the way I started Cabana was by living in London. I wasn't working at the time and I would just spend hours and hours at the British Museum or at the V&A on the floors that were the less, you know, the less sort of visited and, and not very crowded, like the ceramics floor, the ancient glass floor at the, at the V&A. Um, and all the different, you know, cultures at the British Museum. And, and, it's, and it's when you see all this and you understand the crossroads of all the civilizations, I think, um, you know, that's, that's just what we like to do with, with cabanas, just bring it all together. So you answered um, another question for both. How do you cultivate your eye? What a question. Yeah. Well, well, I think I just replied to that. So I, I would love to hear it from you. Well, you know, being, being Roman, how do you cultivate your eyes? You go... You just walk you, on the streets. You, you no, know, you enter a church. And, you know, how many churches uh, in, you know, I don't know, maybe a hundred only in my neighborhood. And, uh, but what is interesting is that Italy is not just full of museums and, uh, and public and private collections, but it's really the all this, this, this wealth, this richness in, in terms of palaces, of churches, art is everywhere, of monuments, fountains, and, you know, every corner teaches you proportions, materials, beauty, and even, you know, just go for a walk in a public uh, villa, Villa Borghese, uh, or Villa Panfili, or, you know, or just sitting in a bar in front of the Pantheon, and yes. enjoy the proportions of this incredible architecture. It's, it's, uh, it's endless. Um, what I suggest to our friends is to, you know, each time you travel, even for work, even for just to spend, just to take, you know, an hour and, and go to see something, just, you know, just uh, maybe something just, that, that you, you, you never thought about visiting, something that is not part of your, your education necessarily, something new, something that may attract you, maybe something that you think you will never be interested in, and then it could be a surprise. Yeah, that's so true. And I think, be curious. Be curious, uh, exactly. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, that's a key. So, and that's, uh, that's what I think made uh, Renzo Mongiardino and Federico Porche to stars. Yes, and, and yeah, well, uh, there is, what do you think is the future of fairs? Well, I think uh, we just have to wait. We are now seeing the end of the tunnel. So I think uh, hopefully by the fall there will be uh, you know, an, an and overwhelming... A renewed interest because people will go back to see things with different eyes because I think the good thing about this pandemic, about us stopping, is it has calmed down everyone. And I think we will have the eye and the time. We will take the time to appreciate things. Yes. Um, so that, I think, is one of the positive aspects of of this of these two very complicated years martina art requires time yeah. art enjoying art understanding these objects uh, and, and this is from my point of view of an antique dealer who spends a lot of time with the objects i you know very often i i, I buy something i keep it there i look at it for many days i try to understand it better art requires slow time requires a different kind of rhythm that we were used to before so we have to you know think about it very 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 clearly and and the and the and fairs are a wonderful occasion to to look at objects in a different way again to speak to the antique dealers to the gallerists to talk to them to 
to, to be informed, to get the message from people who spend a lot of time understanding, studying what they are presenting. Yes, yes. And, and fall in love with objects. Just do it. <laughs> yeah. So I think that uh, we can tell our friends that they, can, that they will be able to see this discussion on TEFF Instagram account. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I think that we can tell everybody to stay in touch with TFF and also with your cabana. Yes. <laughs> well, I was I was really touched. Um, thank you, Alessandra, for asking me to do this, and thank you to TFF. It's a real honor to be on their platform. Um, and so, and it's been a great hour spent together. I hope we will do it again soon in person. Yeah. Um, And thank you, everyone, for being here and for watching. Thank you, Martina. Thank you for this this wonderful conversation. And I hope that there will be an opportunity to do it again very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.